episode 241. Welcome to Data Skeptic, a podcast about data science and fake news from an algorithmic perspective. Here's your host, Kyle Polich. Coming to you from Los Angeles, California, welcome to Data Skeptic and our continuing series on fake news. Today, we've got a long overdue look into the topic of fact checking. And what could be a more data skeptic way to talk about fact checking? Well, talk about automated fact checking. I had a chance to speak to Mivan Babakar, head of automated fact checking at an organization called Full Fact. Fact checking seems like a non trivial problem. How do you automate it? Well, we'll get into that. Mivan does a really nice job breaking fact checking down into a couple of stages and talking about which ones are automatable today and which ones aren't. Well, without further ado, let's get into it. My name is Mivan Babaka, and I am head of automated fact checking at Full Fact. What is Full Fact? Full Fact is the UK's independent fact-checking charity. So we've been fact-checking since 2010. And what we mean by fact-checking is giving people the information that they need in as close to real time as possible to make up their own minds on issues that they care about. Gotcha. So let's maybe start from the user's perspective. What is it like to get real-time fact-checking? How do I consume that information? At the moment, our fact-checking isn't that real-time unless you are in an election and we are doing live fact-checking of presidential speech or a prime ministerial speech, or maybe you might have candidates up on a stage and a whole team will be in the office of a new studio. And within minutes, we might actually get a fact check out to the ear of the producer who might push back in real time. That's what happens in exceptional wartime periods of elections. But day to day, our fact checking is about looking at the most influential and important claims that are circulating around the news media or campaigns or people who are often in positions of power or have a platform, and then doing the research that maybe you might do if you had the time and taking it back to primary sources and packaging that up for people so that they can have all that information to hand and they can have all the primary sources to hand if they want to check it themselves. So it seems to me there's no shortage of facts worth checking. How do you decide where to invest your time? That's a really good question. And it's a really difficult question to answer because we know that the way that we choose at the moment could be better. And that's partly why my automation work exists, so we can better answer this question. But at the moment, what we do is we monitor the day's media. So we're looking at all of the political TV shows in the UK. We're looking at all of the newspapers, big press releases that may have come out from campaign groups or claims that might be trending across social media that maybe readers have sent us in, for example. And we will collect all of that and the editorial team will sit down and have an editorial meeting and decide between them which are the most influential, important and interesting claims of the day. And then our time will be spent answering that. But it doesn't stop there. We also monitor exactly what we have selected, which party it corresponds to, which narrative it corresponds to. And we have in-depth metrics on how many things we have picked from one side, how many from another. And we try and, on general, keep it balanced across the entire spectrum. Another thing that we do is look at the Ipsos Mori's Issue Index, which is a survey question that gets sent out to a representative sample of the UK, and people can answer whichever way they want. The question is, what are the most important issues facing Britain today? And often, the most important issues are economy, immigration, and health, healthcare, NHS. But more recently, it's been Brexit in Europe. And what we do is we try and anchor the things that we check to the issues that people in Britain think are actually the most important issues facing the country. Gotcha. And I obviously want to get into the topic of automated fact-checking, but before we take that leap, what does it mean to fact-check? What is that process like for a human fact-checker? Boy, it's complicated to be a human (laughs) fact-checker. So... Uh It really depends on the claim that you are checking. At Full Fact, we start by calling up the person who actually made the claim, if we can. Mm. So in the UK, if it is a politician or if it's a campaign group, we will call up the press office of that campaign group or sometimes directly the person who made the claim. And we will ask them, where did they get their information if it hasn't already been published? And what did they do with that information <laughs> that meant that they got to that particular answer? So a lot of the time, we're trying to understand what are the assumptions that they've made or calculations that they've made that have gotten there. And then our job as fact checkers is, is to deconstruct all of that and kind of say, well, this is what this person did with this data. But given the best available data in the UK or in the world, 
this is what the actual answer is, and this is the limitations of this data, or this is a place where actually we haven't collected a lot of data, so it's really hard to know. And our job is to lay all of that out as fact checkers in the most interesting and accurate way, an unbiased way, so that people can make a decision for themselves about whether they want to believe it or not, and also have a better understanding of the information ecosystem around that particular issue. Because a lot of the time, we'll be telling people that, yes, this is right, and this is the data to back it up, or no, this is wrong, and here's better data that shows another number. Or we'll be saying, actually, we don't know because there really isn't data on this topic or the data that we do have is collected in such a way that means you can't compare over time or across these different kinds of data sets. And we feel it's important for fact checking to also elucidate those limitations. Yeah, makes sense. So I imagine it's much easier to generate claims than to fact check them. So it's natural that we'd want to put some automation in place. But what does that actually mean? How do we take that complicated process and mechanize it? Good question. So the parts that I've been talking about so far are not really the parts that can be automated. I don't really want to send a robocall to every single person who's ever made a claim and ask them, where did you get your numbers from? I don't think that will really get us anywhere. Uh But there are certain parts of the fact-checking process that are good candidates for automation. So very loosely, the fact-checking process can be broken down into monitoring, monitoring the day's media, spotting, spotting claims in the media, checking, actually doing the work of calling people up, and then publishing. And then there's also a fifth category at the bottom, which is interventions. So these are on top of our fact-checking. We also ask people to correct the record. We also collect evidence about people getting things right and wrong over time and people's public perceptions over time. So the things within that five-numbered list, monitoring, spotting, checking, publishing, and our interventions work, the two that are the best for automation, really, I feel right now, are spotting and monitoring. So it's much, much easier for a piece of software to be looking through all of the claims, all of the sentences that are made in public debate, and then extracting all of the claims instead of my poor media monitoring officer, Tom, for example. So that's a very concrete way in which automation could help fact checkers an awful lot. Another place where we feel that it could help is in spotting repeat instances of things that we have already fact checked. So we know that we're already sitting on a bank of several thousand fact checks that we've already done since 2010. Instead of using these things once, we could surface them in real time when they're repeated and try to spot trends in a much more holistic way. And to that end, we have built two products that help us do exactly that. Oh, can we get into those? Is that live and trends? Yeah, exactly. So live is our live fact-checking tool. Um, What it does is it does speech to text in real time of a presidential speech or a prime ministerial speech. It will generate a transcript for you. And then three things happen to that transcript in real time. First, it takes a sentence and says, do we have a fact check for this already? And if we do, it will surface that fact check. Or it will say, do we have good data that can answer this question or answer this statement in this sentence? And if we do, it will generate a graph in real time of the latest data. So for example, if someone says employment has fallen by 5%, it will take the latest numbers from the Office of National Statistics and generate a graph for you. So you can choose and just make a choice right then and there about whether to believe that or not. And the final thing that it does is, if it can't do any checking, it can at least say, does this sentence contain a claim or not? And if it does contain a claim, then that sentence will be highlighted to show that this is something that is a good candidate for being checked. And that's as a result of some machine learning that we have worked on. Very neat. And Who are those tools really aimed at? Is that for a researcher or a journalist to be getting some insight into the news media they're consuming, or are you really targeting the general audience? So we're definitely targeting fact-checkers and journalists here. I'm looking for the things that fact-checkers do very manually right now, and I'm looking to speed up their processes. And I think that's probably the safest thing to be doing right now. And it also means the fact checkers around the world that have very limited resources can start to work slightly faster and work slightly more at scale. Yeah, it seems to be that's what a lot of, in my opinion, the breakthroughs in machine learning have been. Not that they've replaced jobs, but they've empowered people, at least to date. Is that more or less what you guys are finding? 
Absolutely. And I think that's where we think it's most prudent to be focusing efforts right now. I know that there are a lot of companies that are trying to look into ways that we can solve the huge umbrella problem of fake news. But actually, fake news is made up of many different types of issues. It's misinformation, it's disinformation, it's malinformation. And within each of these different types, there are different taxonomies and harms that can be caused and different distribution mechanisms. And I really do believe that you can't really think of a technical solution until you fully understand and define the problem that you are trying to solve and for whom. And I think that for us, a full fact, we know that the problem that we're trying to solve is one of misinformation. And it's one of journalists and fact checkers not having enough time to fact check something at scale or at speed. And we're trying to cut down the time it takes to respond to misinformation. And I think that that really focuses our efforts in a few particular places. Thanks to Gartner for sponsoring this week's episode. Beyond being a research and advisory services organization known for our publication, Gartner also has a broad portfolio of events. That's Gartner analyst Michael Moran. We recently sat down to discuss the upcoming Gartner Data and Analytics Summit in Orlando, Florida, March 18th through 21st, 2019. For the 2019 summit season, we have nine tracks and 150 plus sessions that span a variety of forms. So who should be attending the summit? analytics and business intelligence types to include data scientists and data engineers, data professionals who are over on the management side of the house, so information or data management, then senior IT and business leaders with a focus on chief data officers. Tell your boss you want to attend the Gartner Data and Analytics Summit in Orlando next March. GartnerEvents.com slash data skeptic for more information. Could we talk a little bit more about how you employ machine learning in those efforts? Sure. So the way that we use machine learning at the moment is for our claim detection that I previously spoke about. So this is identifying whether it contains a claim or not. So what we did is defined what is a claim according to a seven type taxonomy. Mm -hmm. So these uh, claims, a sentence can be sorted into something that contains a quantity in the past or present. It might be a legal claim, might be a prediction, might be a causation or correlation. And we generated these groupings out of our experience as fact checkers over the past eight years. And this was a first attempt at trying to build a model as a result of collecting 25,000 annotations from 80 volunteers. And we asked them to take sentences from political TV shows and assign them to these seven different categories that we've come up with as a result of fact-checking for eight years now. And then from that data that we collected, we built a model based off of something called InfoSent, which is a sentence embedding model which actually takes into account word order, whereas previous attempts hadn't done that. And the results that we got were actually pretty great in terms of recall as well as precision, and it actually improved upon the current gold standard by about 5%. We're presenting it at EMNLP in a workshop called Fever just in a few days, actually. How do you measure the efficiency of a fact checker? Is it facts checked per day or something along these lines? Well, so the efficiency of the claim detection model, we are assessing by the anecdotal evidence that we get from our fact checkers. And a couple of them have said actually that it helps them an awful lot, especially during a live fact checking situation. Now, instead of focusing on an entire transcript, they can only focus on the bits that are highlighted, which they know are the bits that they really need to care about because those are the claims that actually need their attention. Mm. And that doesn't mean that there isn't somebody reading the whole transcript because there always has to be. But it now means that not everybody has to be reading the whole transcript. And I think for a team of 12 people, that makes a really big difference. In other ways, we measure efficiencies by mostly through our second tool, actually, which is called Trends. And what Trends does is it finds repeat instances over time. And we look in newspapers, in Parliament, everything said in Parliament on the official record. And we look in specific political Facebook groups and pages, the ones that are public. And we try to map the spread of misinformation of the claims that we've already fact-checked and see who is repeating them and where are they being repeated. We measure efficiency in this way on trends because when we do a fact-check, we don't just stop there. We also get a correction. We also try to take it out of circulation. So when we can see things being repeated, one of the things we try and do is minimize the number of repetitions over time and actually measure that over the coming months to try and completely take things out of circulation. 
Oh, interesting. So you don't really have a counterfactual in that case, but maybe you have historical trends. Is there a big modeling component to that? So at the moment, actually, that's all done very manually. The monitoring is done in a more automated way, as in we're scraping a lot of newspapers and we're finding repeat instances. Mm -hmm. But actually, one of the research projects we have on at the moment is whether we can do that claim matching in a much more sophisticated machine learned way. And in the long run, as we generate better data, I would really love to see if we can actually run a counterfactual, whether we can actually run a randomized control trials of like the number of interventions done and whether that actually changes behavior over time. Those are quite large social science research questions. Yeah, yeah, big questions. <laughs> yeah, the, luckily I don't have to deal with. We have a, a research scientist in our team, a um, brilliant woman called Amy Sippet, who has to deal with how do we actually measure the impacts that we are having at scale like this. Once you've encountered a claim, it seems to me that something can be factual, but maybe deceptive. For example, I can say some statistic is on the rise. And is that because the population is growing or because the percentage of the population is growing? And both are mathematically accurate. But how do you look at it from a fact checking point of view? What we try to do in our manual fact checks is actually give people the means to decide that for themselves in the future. So the example I like to use that's maybe a bit simpler is that Jeremy Corbyn and Theresa May will often get up at Prime Minister's questions and talk about poverty. And one of them will say that poverty is rising, and the other one will then almost immediately afterwards say that actually, no, poverty is going down. And they can do this back and forth for a while. And I think that the role of the fact checker and the role of any kind of automated system in that situation is to say, actually, they're both kind of right, because there are two measures of poverty in the country. One is going up and one is going down, absolute and relative poverty. And this whole body of work and around cherry picking and around the extra information that you might need to be able to make sense of this situation that isn't necessarily about whether this is right or this is wrong. But it's almost like what is the missing piece of this argument that is incredibly vital? And I haven't seen many people doing work on that in a machine learned or automated way because it's incredibly difficult. It's very hard for even us as humans to be doing, let alone machines to be doing. But to that end, what we are doing to kind of start to edge away at that question a little bit is we work quite closely with the Office for National Statistics in the UK. And one of the projects that I have going with them is about caveats to data. Yeah. So in 2003, I think it was, the murder rates in the country actually spike quite highly. <laughs> and if you were just looking at that number, you'd assume it's because there were more murders in the country that year, right? Mm -hmm. That's the sensible thing to assume. But actually, there's a big caveat to that data, which is in that year, that is when all of the murders of one particular person, Harold Shipman, were recorded. And that was something like 20, 30 murders, I think. And this was a doctor who had, over his career, actually killed a lot of people. And if you didn't have that piece of information, if you didn't have that caveat to that data, that this is actually about one particular incident recording all this data in one go, then you wouldn't interpret that data in the right way. So one of the projects that we have going is about how can we create a taxonomy of these different caveats that can be interpreted by any machine learning or sophisticated statistical system that can give people this kind of context and allow them to make smarter choices in real time about that data. So that's hopefully you can see how that is starting to edge at that problem, yeah. but it doesn't quite go all the way to fixing the what are we missing for this whole debate problem. How did you arrive at that particular taxonomy? You know, maybe we could add a few more or put a few less in, but it, it does seem rather complete to me. I'm curious about, is that some sort of industry standard people have arrived at or is that full facts kind of original taxonomy? So what we did is we actually just looked at an awful lot of examples to the data uh -huh. and actually looked at some of the PDFs that are written that go alongside the data and tried to extract the caveats that are already in the PDFs, but haven't been written in a machine readable way, for example. And from there, we tried to classify as many of them as possible into subgroups and then supergroups. And then it's just been a long process of trial and error. Are any of those more challenging? I could imagine where maybe satire is a thorn in your side that could perhaps be especially difficult to detect or something given its structure. Do you see any differences or more challenging flavors of fake news? Oh, you mean of fake news particularly? Oh, I guess I slipped that in. I really should. I mean, we can comment on fake news, but just more in terms of the labeling what type of fact it is. 
So the previous caveats that I was talking about were actually caveats to data from official statistics. But if you're talking specifically about misinformation, then and there are lots of different types, as you say. There are some that are much harder to identify than others, absolutely. And it's actually very hard to identify intent and also harm of these things at scale. So we know that some types of misinformation, like satire, like you say, is very, very hard to spot. But I've also seen a really interesting study that says that if you follow people's eye movements as they're reading something, then when they read something that it's satirical, they tend to look at it a couple more times just to make sure that it is actually funny <laughs> or they have like mm. to get a different reading of it each time. So it's possible that we might have some small quirks that give away what we're reading, but I'm not really sure I want to start surveillancing everybody's eyeball movements at all times <laughs> to identify something that might be from the onion. But there are yeah, definitely like <laughs> interesting research problems and different kinds of tactics to identify different things. And I think that as we get more and more sophisticated models and methods, we have to be careful about what we're spotting, but also unintended consequences of spotting things in specific ways. Mm -hmm. Have you found that any politicians or I guess it could be news broadcasters or presenters or anyone like that who has been fact checked through your system or maybe that of others as well? Do people change their behavior at all? Or have you seen cases where people start to refine the way they present information? Absolutely. Yeah, there's been good examples and bad examples. So there is, for example, one government department that now has as its KPI, do not be fact-checked by full fact, which is pretty great. <laughs> um, and then there are other examples where actually we were taking our entire team to do live fact-checking on a prominent political TV show in the UK. And we found that everybody, when they were told there were fact-checkers on like on hand to fact check the things that they were saying, stopped making claims very suspiciously. <laughs> so they started talking a lot more about what they believe about the world and actually stopped making maybe as many claims as they would have if we weren't there. We think that that obviously has good consequences and bad consequences. So that is one of the maybe unintended consequences of bringing automated fact checking into the world for the public is that maybe people make even fewer and fewer claims. And then what does that leave us with? So I think there are very profound questions, actually, that we need to answer about what do we mean to be a good debate and what is a helpful debate when it comes to politics and democracy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm curious about where you intend to scale the tools, live and trends that we've been talking about. Do they need more data, more algorithmic work, a broader reach of crawling? What's kind of the final frontiers for these sorts of projects? So even in their current iterations, which are still quite simple, they are bringing quite a lot of value into our fact-checking operation. And I know that if I give this in this form right now to fact-checkers around the world, it will also bring them value because actually fact-checkers often tend to be quite small teams and they tend to not really have the ability to build tech tools, for example, um, or have developers on staff. So what I am hoping to do in the next few months is onboard about 30 fact-checkers around the world. And the idea is that we can then start monitoring the spread of misinformation in public places of things that they have already fact-checked and start to maybe have collect evidence of what works well, what doesn't work well, what kind of interventions are the ones that maybe we should be focusing on more or researching the effects of more. And actually, how does that change in different political and cultural contexts? Because it's one thing in the UK to make a complaint to the UK Statistics Authority. But if you don't have a regulator in your country for statistics, what do you do? Who do you talk to? If you don't have an office for national statistics, what does that do to the information ecosystem? And we're hoping to, as we onboard more people around the world, start to get some interesting data around that can maybe point us in to, to an answer for some of those questions. Yeah, yeah makes sense. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on Wikipedia as a source. How does that play in or does it play in as a tool in a fact checker's workflow? So the thing about Wikipedia, Wikipedia has a lot of fantastic information on it. But when it comes to political or contentious topics, I don't think it fares so well. I'd also say that one of the limitations in terms of for fact checkers of Wikipedia 
is that actually it only accepts secondary sources and not primary sources. That is one of the tenets of Wikipedia. And actually a lot of the work that our fact checkers are doing from calling people up or from actually like taking a data set and playing with it and generating that calculation and that wouldn't be acceptable in Wikipedia world, which is actually why Wikitribune came about because it tried to answer some of these problems in a more newsy kind of way. Obviously it's worth saying that Wikipedia and Wikitribune are completely different, but they do have Jimmy Wales in common. So in the last hundred years, seen a lot of revolutions in how people get information from newspapers to TV and radio and the internet now. I'm aware, I'm not a historian, but I'm aware at certain points in the past, people have said, oh, TV is going to rot your brain and that didn't seem to happen. But it does seem in certain ways to me that the internet is a bit unique in its volume and its velocity and the fact that anyone can get information out there. Do you see it the same way? And if so, or if not, how do those, you know, how does the nature of the internet affect the process of doing fact checking? So I think it's worth saying that misinformation isn't new. Misinformation has been around for a very long time. And so has low trust in politicians. Like, these aren't new phenomenons. The new phenomenons, like you say, are about speed and scale and also about maybe slightly fewer trusted institutions or like just fewer institutions. And therefore, it's much harder to place trust in certain places because there are just so many other places that are throwing information at you at any one time. And we recently released a report called Tackling Misinformation in an Open Society. And in that, we say that the most important thing in all of this is to protect free speech. It's very easy to build systems that might limit the free speech of one group over another because we're trying to limit the effects of misinformation. But actually, that's a very profound thing to erode. And I think we should be very careful about stopping content spreading or stopping equality of platform all of a sudden because of the risk of misinformation. One of the things that we introduce in that report is this idea of different harms associated with different pieces of misinformation. There's plenty of things that are wrong that actually have absolutely no consequence in the world. I think of all of the times that somebody tweets something that is completely innocuous but completely wrong. Mm -hmm. So we don't necessarily want to stop people saying things that are wrong. It's an important part of everyday life. But there are certain harms that cause disengagement in democracy or interference in elections or actually cause risks to life, like yes. public health misinformation or information that might cause radicalization, for example. And I think that when it comes to those categories of harms, it's really important that we try to act in the most sensible way. But I think for the most part, the most important thing that we could do is make sure that any solution doesn't overreach and get into free speech. Yeah, I think that's uh, very well said. If listeners want to catch up and read that report, where can we direct them? Fullfact.org, and it will be right there. Live and Trends is being built internally and being shared with fact checkers around the world in the next few months. Maybe sometime next year, we might open it up to a broader pool of individuals who are interested. But at the moment, it's really only for fact checkers and then for journalists sometime next year. Gotcha. Yeah, well, uh, maybe a good time for a journalist to get on the waiting list or something along those lines. Yeah. And, and if you do want to join the waiting list, it's at fullfact.org forward slash automated. And to wind up, can you tell me a little bit about Full Fact? How does the organization run? So Full Fact is, is actually very careful about how it's run. So we actually have a cross-party board of trustees. So we have people from all sides of the political spectrum who run it. And then the staff at Full Fact, though, have a very different remit. We're not actually allowed to have opinions on public policy. And there are strict rules about what we can and can't do in terms of public debate. So for example, I'm not going on any political marches anytime soon. And that kind of say, that neutrality runs all the way down into the organization, including our funding. But there's no such thing as neutral funding. <laughs> so we try and keep as diverse a range of funding as possible. Um, so we're funded by individuals, by crowdfunders and trusts and philanthropic grants in the UK and internationally. So that's all the way from small funding to large funding. One of the rules that we try to maintain is that not more than 20% of our funding comes from one source in an annual year. And that's something that we really hope that's actually been a really hard rule to grow with. Mm -hmm. But it's an important rule, I think, if you want to stay independent and neutral. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. And what about crowdsource contributions? If a listener thought these were worthwhile efforts, what can they do? 
So we actually have a volunteering list that you can sign up to if you're interested. We'll inevitably be running some more crowdsourced annotation tasks. We're also going to hopefully introduce for interested data scientists and developers three-month stints with our automated fact-checking team to get on board and help us build out parts of our system if you're interested. And the details for all of that can be found at fullfact.org forward slash automators. Oh, very exciting. I hope some people check that out. Is there anything you think we didn't touch on we should go back and make sure to inject? I don't think so. I think you've been very patient with me. Thank you. <laughs> oh, not at all. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Let me think of a good sign-off question then. Let's see. I'll go back to your five points, I think. It's so very much like the list you gave us earlier, that monitoring and spotting of claims are, are things that are very automatable. Checking seems to be in the human domain for a while. Publishing and interventions. To close out, maybe, do you have any thoughts on where automation and machine learning could eventually play a role in those regards? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, we've actually started work on the checking side of things as well. So we have built a system that can parse out a sentence into topic, trend, geography and time. From there, we can direct it to the right data set if we have the data in an API. Oh, neat. And then we can actually generate a graph in real time of the right data with the right geography and time period. That is a very nascent project that we have going, but mm. it's actually going really, really well. And we're quite impressed by how far it's got, even though it's quite simple right now. Even if we can only have like, let's say 5,000 claims checked very manually by the system in terms of very like simple claims checked by the system, that's still 5,000 more fact checks than we could have ever done, right? So even if it is the GDP has risen by 2% since last year, that's repeated a fair number of times in public debate and in parliament. And if we can do a check of those things, that's that's still value. So I'm really hopeful that a system like that could go a really long way to helping us. But in terms of more sophisticated checking, in terms of question answering, in terms of actually trying to assign importance and context in real time in a shifting political landscape, that's a really difficult thing. And I think it's a thing that humans aren't very good at. And I don't think machines are going to be able to help us with that anytime soon either. Yeah. One day, perhaps. We'll, uh, time will tell. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Vivan, thank you very much for coming on and uh, sharing your perspective and talking about your work at Full Fact. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for listening to Data Skeptic, where the news may be fake, but the data doesn't lie. Show your support by getting a t-shirt at dataskeptic.com.